welcome everybody to our next talk in HS4 on FrostCon Cloud Edition 2021. This talk or this lecture is uh, in English. Um, since Martin is uh, is an English okay uh, in the English only speaker at least for international conferences, but since FrostCon is international, that's not a problem. Martin will talk about the Terra Sentinel uh, and his experiences with databases for their Honeypot uh, network probes, uh, honey, Honeypot probes running network, um, and the the advantages, advantages and the pros and the cons of the different database types they have tested and used. If you have any questions, please join us in the BBB uh, conference room because there's a chat you can place your, your questions in and we will have a Q&A session after the talk. And Martin will try to answer every question you have there. Um, just if you are in the stream and have a question, just hop over to the conference uh, room uh, and just type your, your question in the chat. And now, without further ado, Martin about Terra Sentinel. Thank you for the introduction. Hello again, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching. I would like to first introduce myself. My name is Martin Brodek, and I work for Czech Domain Registry, a company called CZNIC, and I work there as a guarantor of a security team called Tourist Sentinel, which provides security enhancements for tourist routers. As you may uh, mention, CZNIC is therefore not only a domain registry, it also supports or directly develops a wide range of other security, DNS-related, educational, or network-related projects like FRET, which is a domain and a no, registry software, which currently covers the Czech national domain and also domain of several other countries. The other big project is NodeDNS, an authoritative DNS server, which is currently used by the Czech domain DNS stack. Notary Solver is a lightweight and highly scalable DNS uh, caching recursive server, which is used among others, for example, by uh, Cloudflare. BERT is a uh, internet routing daemon used by the majority of European network exchange points, for example, London's links or Frankfurt-based DKIX. And in the context of this presentation, the most important project is TURIS. TURIS project emerged some eight years ago as a uh, scientific project whose, whose aim was to monitor internet connection of an average Czech household and to uh, detect potential threats inside, from inside or outside its network. To achieve this, a uh, router-like probes were uh, developed and distributed among the people in exchange for symbolic one check crown. Uh, the routers were uh, built on powerful hardware. They were able to handle up to a gigabit connection and of course, they were open source. The operating, operating system called Tourist OS was based on the top of widely known open source OpenWRT. And besides this, it uh, was equipped with a bunch of open source uh, monitoring software, which was able to collect data about attempts to attack the router or attempts to scan the router's open ports. This, uh, now I can say old system was called uCollect and uh, its main results or main outputs was a dynamic firewall, which was then pushed back to the routers so that the routers were secured by the same data they provided to our headquarters. And uh, other very important output was a gray list, which was free to use by everybody. The routers were a great success, and there was an increased public demand for them, even in the commercial sphere. So the company decided to uh, run a crowdfunding Indiegogo campaign for the next generation of the routers. The campaign was, campaign was successful, 
And in the 2016, the second generation of the routers, routers were developed and uh, started to be commercially available in the Czech Republic and around the world. The second generation was named Tourist Omnia and wasn't the last one because currently the last one, the most new generation is called Tourist Mox. It's uh, picked it here. And we think that it's actually the first modular router in the world. This new router started also to be equipped with a new version of our data collection system. We named this system to Sentinel and uh, data collection was only was just optional this time. So you were not forced by any contract to uh, collect the data. And independently of your decision about data collection, you were still able and you are still able to use its outputs like the dynamic firewall and the gray list. Uh, now, why I am bothering you with this history. The reason is that this uh, lecture is going to be about databases, about the databases which we used. And uh, the old data collection system I mentioned was built around a single central database, which was uh, responsible for data storage, its updates, and the final visual visualization. This system was uh, it was quite well designed for a scientific purposes and uh, was scaled to uh, work okay with few thousands of connected routers. But with the commercial success of the later generations of the routers, the database seems to be or was uh, in a big danger of being underperformant under the big load of all that inserts and updates and uh, selects and everything. So before this can happen and before the database started to be really set, we decided to uh, start the development of the new data collection system. I already said the name, it's, it's, its name is Tourist Sentinel. And we started the, the, started the development with uh, three important uh, rules in our mind. The first important rule concept was to prepare for any amount of connected devices, because this time we can be never sure how many new routers will be deployed and those how many collect, uh, connected clients there will be uh, even not mentioning that we think about uh, the possibility of Sentinel deployment even outside to routers, which is now under development. The second most important rule was that we try to process the data in streams. So there would be no need to update the already stored the data in our uh, databases. And to achieve this, we created, I think, quite complex uh, pipeline infrastructure in our servers. Uh, if you are interested in more detail in our pipeline infrastructure, there are several other talks in which I described, me or my colleagues described, uh, the exact components of the pipelines, which are mostly also open source. The third rule we had in our mind was that there should be no central database this type this time and we then tried to uh, use rather three different types of databases and try to use them uh, so they have the they are used in a best way in which they were developed, or how to say it. So this is probably the very beginning of this lecture. First, I will give the brief overview of the database we use, it, we use currently. Uh, I will say a very few words about Postgres as it's very well known database. So there's probably no need to describe it and to lose some lose time with it. Then I will say a few more words about Redis in memory database. And then I will spend a big portion, the majority of this lecture, 
with influx DB. Uh, by the end of this lecture, I would like to show you the current architecture overview and the position of all the, insp the database instances in it. So, start with Postgres. As all of you probably know, Postgres or, or PostgreSQL is a traditional relational database which uh, development started some 30 years ago. So now it has quite a long tradition. It supports a wide range of from primitive to a very complex data types. And it also has very powerful and advanced concurrency, proven reliability and disaster recovery. Uh, we use Postgres as the uh, central main database in the old data collection system. So we also uh, were facing some drawbacks of this database. Uh, for us, the most important was the lack of some easy or implicit data retention, because with all the things we've done to the database with all the updates, we were like facing the problem of uh, growing data and uh, so this was the problem I think we were to uh, resolve. There are, but there are other, other drawbacks, like there's probably no support of columnar tables and also the uh, compression, like some implicit compression of the data store is a bit pain. The second database we use, it's Redis, Redis in-memory database. It's usually referred as to uh, key value storage, but its authors uh, prefer to talk about it as about uh, in-memory data structure store, which emphasizes the fact that Redis is able to store even more complicated data types. Among other strings, then list of strings, sets of strings, even sorted sets of strings, and also object like uh, object or data types, which is uh, which are called hashes in the context of Redis. And Redis could be used almost like a traditional database. You can use it also as a cache, and it could be used as a message broker or some type of message queue. And here I must say that we use it in all that ways. Redis has built-in replication, support for Lua scripting and transactions. Uh, when you are deploying Redis, you can be sure that you can set between different levels of on-disk persistence. And uh, very important uh, thing we are very keen on is the support of data retention, because whenever you store a key to the Redis, you can explicitly set its expiration, and you can even be notified by a uh, so-called Redis key space notification when the key expires. This is an exam. Ah, this is our use case of Redis. I already said that we use it in many uh, different situations. And we mainly use it as a uh, storage for the list of the IP addresses placed on our gray list. Uh, we really uh, take advantage of the data retention here because when we placed some address to the gray list and the, there are no recorded incidents in a defined period of time, the address simply expires and it's dropped from the gray list. Whereas when there are some recorded incidents, um, meanwhile the address is on the gray list, the address expiration is simply prolonged and stays there for some longer period. Before the address is even placed on the gray list, it must uh, surpass a defined threshold of some score, we call it a score of evilness. And we use Redis also to keep this uh, scores of each IP address. The 
use it as a message queue. We use Redis as a message queue in our certificate or component. The certificate component takes care about issuing a TLS certificate that ensures that the communication between our probes and the server will be secure. And the last use case, cache, we use simply uh, Redis as a cache for our web interface when there are cached the most uh, used queries. And now the example, we use Python in our pipelines. So this is a Python example. I mentioned that uh, Redis supports transactions. So we want to use all that operation listed below, below in a single transaction. So first we acquire a pipe and using this and all that commands preset in this pipe are then finally uh, really proceed in one, uh, in one transaction. So the first thing we want to do here, uh, actually, yeah. So this example tries to show you how we increase a score of an IP address before it's, it surpasses the threshold and is played and it's placed on the gray list. So in this few commands, we just want to increase the score. So first, when there are there is no key for the score yet in the Redis, defined by, by this nx equals true, we set the score to zero and set its expiration. Then in both cases, uh, when the score is either newly created or there was an older one, we want to increase it by the defined score and then set the expiration of the key. We have to set the expiration here once again, because there's no guarantee in Redis that the key doesn't expire in the in this very transaction. So in this situation, there was a there was the score key before, and we didn't create it by this line. And then uh, by a big accident, the key expires between these lines. It would it would be implicitly created by this line, but without an expiration set. So this is the reason why the expiration must be uh, explicitly prolonged. This is from our Redis, and the rest of almost the rest of the presentation I will spend with InfantDB, as I uh, think that it's not so widely known, and you may want to know something more about it. So InfantDB is a time series database. Its development started in 2013, and it took our attention only a year ago when a big release named 2.0 was uh, finished. This release brought us a uh, major changes, which I cover in the next of the in the rest of the presentation. Uh, for now, we can say that InfluxDB is very widely used, mostly in IoT, monitoring, analytics, and more. But firstly, I would like to define what the term time series exactly means. Uh, time series is a, we can say it's a measurement of a single value during the time. And it could be either regular, then we refer to it as a matrix uh, that can be, for example, temperature or some CPU load parameters. And besides regular, a measurement of a single value during the time can be also irregular. Then we talk about it as about events that can be which can be example a change state of some iot sensor of a, or a situation when some attacker used a specific password in an attempt to log into a twist router this time series consists of measurements or uh, single points of the measurement 
every measurement inside a time series, inside time series consists of few fields. The first field is the very name of the measurement, which must be defined. The second field is defines the name of the measured quantity. It's simply called field. And then we uh, real for sure want to store the uh, the, val the value itself. And when we are uh, talking about the time series database, we want to for sure store also the time stamp. Then we are free to use as many tags as we want. Uh, the important thing about tags is that they are indexed. So whenever you want to store some important data besides the value, it should be stored as a tag because the searches uh, the searches for an exact value stored in the value field can take uh, significantly longer. All the values with the same combination of measurement, field, and tax for a time series. So the, we can say we can then say that. All the values inside a single time series differs only in its timestamp and the value. That all the text, field, and measurement are same inside one time series. Uh, the data model is of the InfluxDB is one of the main uh, things that changes uh, in the version 2.0. The current data model consists of organizations and users which are independent then the organizations consists of buckets which are the uh, exact places when we store the data the buckets also takes care about the data retention because we are able to say how what's the max age of the data stored inside a bucket then Besides bucket, there are also tasks, which are some uh, usually regular ta actions, uh, which may transfer data between buckets. They can modify them in a several ways. And inside uh, InfluxDB, there are also checked the runs of the tasks, and there are available logs of them. Beside organize, besides buckets and tasks, there are also dashboards, which I will probably show you uh, later in this lecture in a small demo. I've already mentioned the users. They are independent of the organization, so every user can be assigned access to one or more organizations. And every user can, you can uh, have also one or more access tokens for example, for different applications. Uh, another big change in the version 2.0 is the new language for data querying and scripting of regular tasks, which is called Flux. It was inspired by JavaScript, and it's a preset for stream data processing uh, because each time series in Flux, inside Influx database, is processed as a single table inside Flux. So when we want to query more time series, the result would be something called a stream of tables. And we are then able to merge the tables inside the stream or create, split them to uh, more tables, create some uh, time windows, and uh, much more. To achieve all this task, uh, Flux is provided with a uh, quite rich standard library, which can do all that mentioned things for us. Uh, first, Usually, usually, first we want to have some output from Influx database, so we can use a from function in which we de define the bucket we want to use. Then there is a mandatory function which must uh, mandatorily follows, which is called range. This function defines which time period we are interested in. Then some filtration can follows, 
and the probably most important thing, the transformations of the stream. Uh, we can, as I've already said, merge the tables using a group function. There we should uh, remember that every new tag added to the data would create a uh, brand new table inside the stream processing. So when we want to ignore some tags, we have to uh, group the tables together uh, or to split them based on some other tag. If we want to split the tables uh, based on some time periods, period we want to, we should use the window function and we surely are able to do some data aggregation based on several uh, parameters and use probably count function, sum and much more. The output is provided by the function yield, which is implicitly placed on the end of every query, but can be placed even in the middle of the query so that we are able to get more outputs from a single one. Now let's look at a very basic example of Flask language. In this example, we simply query the bucket call, called my bucket. We want to query all the data uh, younger than one year. And we want to see only the data which are from a measurement called simply temperature measurement. We can complicate this query a bit. So uh, in, in the way that we want to know the mean value of the measured temperature, so we simply have to add the group function to group all the possible tables together. So we have all the measured temperatures inside one table, and then we simply apply the mean function to the table. Maybe it's also important to note that the there's if we didn't use the group function, there would be as many single outputs, like single uh, mean values, as there were as the number of the tables was. Uh, another slightly more complicated example and can be used when we want to see the mean values per every month. So as before, we start by querying the maxi at maximum one year old data. We apply the filter, we group it in into uh, one big table, and then we create a table for every month using the window function. So now we can uh, uh, we can say that there should be some twenty different uh, sorry twelve different tables. We compute a mean value for each of them and simply place all that mean values, all the twelve values, into one table, which we are going to see on the output. Uh, it's, it's, it is very nice to see these uh, simple queries, but uh, as I've already said, we were using our old data collection system before, so we were facing also a problem of the data migration from our old central data, OSWES database to the new InfluxDB. The Flux developers, uh, simplified this task for us because they also prepared a Flask SQL package. And using this package, it's very easy to connect to our current uh, Postgres database and uh, get all the data from it. This is an example of such a maybe migration script. So uh, at the beginning, we simply connect to the database and define the SQL query to load the data from the old database. In this very query, we simply want to query all the incidents uh, recorded on our mini, on, on our telnet mini honeypots, and we want the incidents to be 
enhanced by the country where the originating IP address is registered. When we want to uh, process the resulting data in the influx, we first must uh, define what the timestamp would be. And uh, because the timestamp stored in the Postgres was only in a sec precision in seconds, we have to uh, multiply it by this very big number because influx internally stores the data in nanosecond precision. Then we have to define the measurement name, simple incident count, set the value to one because uh, there's exactly one row for each incident then can be done some aggregation but i will talk about this later and um, because the output the value can be defined only as a string this way we then have to convert it man explicitly to integer uh, the rest is just defining the field value and setting the appropriate text where here we have only the country tag. Another problem was with the uh, this, for, with the presentation of the data because all our queries were written in SQL and we therefore had to rewrite all our SQL queries into Flux. As an example, uh, I've prepared this query when we want to uh, query the number of incidents report reported by uh, different countries. It in SQL it's quite straightforward, but I think that it's straightforward in Flux as well. We simply defined range filter as before. Then we want to uh group the data in columns by country so there is a different uh table for every country then simple count the number of incidents per every table so per, per every country uh, for the ease of use to rename the column value to column count uh, define that we want to keep only the column containing the count and country, make the one big table, and we are done. If we want to something more complicated, and this is probably the most complicated SQL query we were using, uh, this query first uses use this nested query to get the number of to get the list of most active countries. Uh, usually. 10 most active countries. And then we want to select the number of attackers of all that most active countries. So we want to count the distinct IP addresses. I think that once again in Flux, this is maybe even more straightforward because there's no nested query it's, I think, much more linear. First, we simply uh, compute the list of the most active countries using this uh, few flux commands, which were are really similar like that before. What's maybe interesting is that we are only interested in the uh, measurements that includes the country tag and then there is there is a, uh, then we obviously count the incident the number of incidents for each country group them sort them and limit the result only to the top 10 and the last line is probably the only piece of magic in this very in this very q query because there we transform the resulting table into a set, a set of countries, which is then stored inside the top countries variable. The variable is then used in the following query. So we are only interested in queries 
which country tax tech is contained in the set. We uh, then want to see the trend of the uh, incidents caused by this country, and we want to use the numbers for every day. So we uh, use this window function to have a uh, table for every day. Then we group, group it by country, just simply count, and uh, that's that's almost that's almost all. Uh, what I was not yet mentioning is the data retention we are using in our use case. And uh, we use InfluxDB mainly because of its simply data retention. And we decided to use four buckets, each bucket with a different accuracy. Uh, in the beginning, the data are stored into the base bucket. Uh, which has defined the data retency to one week. And every hour, the data are uh, aggregated. So basically, some summed up. And uh, aggregated data are transferred using an uh, influx task to a bucket named hourly. Exactly the same way, every day, the Hourly, the hourly bucket is uh, aggregated and uh, uh, daily data are stored and exactly in the same way the weekly data are prepared. So uh, in the base bucket there should be no data, no data longer than uh, three, longer than one week. In the hourly bucket there should be no data uh, older than three months. And in the daily bucket, there should be no data older than one year. Whereas in the weekly bucket, we uh, plan to store uh, data for, no, I would not probably say forever, for, but for a longer period, which is not yet defined. I already said that we use three tasks to transfer the data between buckets, and the aggregation is done using them. I also didn't yet mention that the Influx database uh, comes with a quite nice uh, web interface, which I am now going to show. At least I will try. The, yeah, it seems that something is happening. So the interface looks like this. I think that it's quite user friendly, especially for the uh, beginners. Uh, also, the Influx DB developers provided you with a big uh, library of code examples for many different programming languages. So, it's very easy to start uh, using it. Uh, for example, we used this Python example almost one-to-one. Uh, -one. If you do not want to use any code, there are other options. For example, the Telegraph plugins, uh, which are fit to scrape your data from uh, several sources, uh, including Cisco routers, system, and databases, much, much more. For the purposes of this presentation, I installed this morning a uh, Telegraph system plugin. So I should have some, yeah, yeah. So I, I should have some data there by this time. I can explore it by this user interface, clicking Telegraph, maybe system, it's load. Uh, choose that uh, server name, submit a query, and we can say that there are some peaks of load during the time. I also set up a task, uh, which is called downsample system load, and the task is, is supposed to downsample the system load uh, every five minutes, and the 
way that it should compute its mean value. So I can try to uh, display both the queries. So this is the exact system load, and I can I can also add the aggregated uh, values with the mean value displayed here. The, there is also a place for the dashboards here in the web interface. And uh, when you use the telegraph, the system dashboard is uh, even pre-configured for you. It's not able to scrape all the system data. So it's only you, possible to see the load I've uh, showed before, but it's not. Uh, a complicated task to uh, make it work. So this was the web interface. And now when you know almost everything about, about Influx, and when you probably already know almost everything about Postgres and about Redis, I can show you the complete architecture overview of our pipelines, of our server infrastructure with the databases highlighted. So to uh, tell you the full image, on the left side, it's supposed, it's supposed to uh, display the router, our router insights, which consists of minipods, which are our minimal honeypods. There are also uh, collectors of our firewall logs and a honeypot as a surface proxy, which is a, a full-fledged SSH honeypot, but not run directly on the routers, uh, but all that traffic is redirected to our headquarters so that the routers are not in, under a threat. Uh, then there are our Sentinel component, other Sentinel components like proxy, which got us all the collected data and send them using MQTT to our servers. There's the certain components, which uh, acquires the certificate for the communication. And then there's the dynamic firewall subscriber, which receives the updates of the dynamic firewall from our headquarters using zero MQ. Now, uh, to the server infrastructure, I've already mentioned the certificator component. Certificator component used Redis database as a message queue here, because all the requests which are uh, acquired by our certification API are then placed to the Redis queue using commands lpush, and then they are processed by our certification authority. The certification authority used Postgres database. And this is probably, yeah, this is for sure the one of two only places in our pipelines where we currently use Postgres. And we use Postgres here as a storage of uh, public keys of the routers. Uh, so that we are able to check that the communication of the routers, which is signed by its private keys, are really from them and not from some of the others. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is done using the checker component. And the other place where we use the Postgres is actually here. Here we store the issued certificates so that when there is a already issued certificate in the Postgres, there is no need for issuing another one. So we, we use Postgres only for as a certificate storage and a storage of the public keys of the routers. Then we can continue to our other pipelines. Uh, these are the in the middle, these are the data processing pipelines. The data uh, 
goes through go through the our mosquito broker then there are a few data enhancing components inside the pipeline itself and the final component called dumper simply stores the data in a form of time series to our influx database uh, in this situation we tried to find the best trade-off between the complexity of a uh, relational database and the simplicity of time series database and we were doing even some benchmarks to help us decide whether it's uh, better to use influx and when it's better to use postgres we end up with something like the postgres is probably much is probably better in performance whereas influx is much easier in the context of uh, data retention and also the storage of the needs for the data storage are a bit lower so that's it and the uh, other uses of redis are also here uh, by the end of our uh, data processing pipeline redis is here connected to our uh, web interface which is called sentinel view and it's here to help uh, influx with the most uh, used queries so that redis is able to cache them for the uh, better performance the last position where we use redis is the middle middle of our dynamic firewall pipeline in the dynamic firewall pipeline we uh, aggregate the data about the attackers and we store the score about every attacker in the redis and in the very same redis we also store the list of uh, ip addresses currently placed on our gray list we used uh, redis key space notification to uh, inform the routers using the event listener uh, about the addresses which were derped from the uh, gray list and we use scoreboard component uh, to notify the routers the clients about the addresses they were newly newly added to the gray list and this is probably all for me so thank you for your attention and i think that we have plenty of time for any questions and answers thank you martin for your insights um as i said before if you have any questions to martin please join us in the big blue button conference come to the chat and ask your question there then i can read it to martin and he can answer it um in the meantime i can uh, i can have a, a one or two questions by my own can you tell us when roundabout you switched from the old postgres based uh, system to the new one uh we, we haven't switched yet actually uh, we are now in the process in the last part of process of switching from the old data collection system to the new one in the next few weeks we are probably going to migrate the last few routers which are still using our older version of our operating system so it's uh pretty like different things are connected here together it's not very straightforward and regarding the switch from progress to influx uh, to be honest we started our new data collected system called Risk sentinel also with postgres and we decided to switch to influx later currently we have deployed uh, our uh, web interface sentinel view with influx only in uh, testing environment and we are 
going to deploy it on production in the next few weeks. And uh, can you tell us round about how many data points or how many gigabyte of data you, you're collecting or storing? Because you have a retention uh, system, yeah, so yeah. You're, you're destroying a lot of uh, data, which is good uh, from the GDPR perspective. But what is the usual amount of data you are handling if you're, if you're analyzing the data? Actually, the data we gather is quite skyrocketing because uh, with the new uh, data collection system, we also deployed a new uh, types of monitoring software, new minipods. Uh, for example, FTP minipod, HTTP minipod. Uh, there were there was already a talent minipod, and the new one is also SMTP minipod, and especially the SMTP and minipods are very like intensively used by the attackers, and uh, we deployed majority of the minipods uh, almost a year ago, and we have several terabytes of data uh, okay. collected from by the time. That, so that's it's a good big, amount of data to analyze. <laughs> terabytes. Yeah. Okay. Apparently, no one has a question here. At least there's nothing coming in the stream and in the, in the chat. Um, so I can tell everyone, if you want to come uh, get in touch with Martin, just give him an email at martin.prudek at nick.cz. Um, Martin, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, thank you very much to show us what, what, you're, uh, what you're doing with Influx, with, with the Honeypot network, what you're planning to do in the next few weeks. I wish you good luck with the migration. And for everybody, have a lovely day. Uh, stay at FrostCon. Have, have, a, have uh, uh, some, some more lectures like the one following here, uh, which will start at 1600. And it will be about matrix bots, so the, the, uh, the messenger uh, protocol matrix, and how to program bots about, uh, for yourself and by yourself. Have a lovely afternoon and bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Bye.